Hey everybody, this is Stuart with Wine on the Dime, and today I'm at Fall Creek Vineyards, and I'm in here with some really cool people. <laughs> so uh, what I would like to do uh, is to just kind of go around and let everybody introduce yourselves, and uh, then we can kind of get into this awesome tasting that Sergio has set up for us. So actually, if you want to mind, can we start with you? I'm Susan Aller. My husband and I own Fall Creek Vineyards, started it in 1975. So here we are. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jolene Jernigan, and I... Uh work with Big Bear's Marketing helping with the social media. And I'm Sergio, winemaker for Creek Vineyards. Awesome, awesome. So as I mentioned, we're going to be exploring some really cool stuff today that Sergio has lined up. So uh, I guess, first of all, let's, before we even do a little bit of the tasting, let's talk about Fall Creek a little bit. So you said 1975 was when Fall Creek was established. Exactly. <laughs> and and how? what was the idea behind that? Because back in 1975, not a lot of people were creating wineries in Texas. No, we were the second one. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, not a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, true. Yes, it was, it was a very sparse back then. But uh, you know, you're out of UT, and, uh, and my husband was interested in uh, taking over the our, our ranch, and uh, we took a trip to France to look at French breed of cattle, and, and thought it was an opportune time to see the French wines, and that was in 1973, and in 1975 we started putting a vineyard in, because he questioned, I wonder if this has ever been done in Texas, and so we thought, well, we'll give it a try. <laughs> and we found a few other people on the High Plains that were experimenting too, and, and we put our vineyard in the hill country. What, what were, uh, varietals did you start with? Well, they were French-American hybrids. We were getting advice from uh, Texas A&M and Texas Tech, and uh, but right, uh, I'd say within five years, we kept going back to France to, to do more research, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, you know, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, those were the varieties that we were enjoying in, in the French vineyards. And we said, hey, let's give it a try. And fortunately, we were able to um, attract the attention of Andre Chelchev, a, a wine writer, put us in touch with him because he was so impressed with our first Cabernet. We had. Uh, that I think Andre tasted in the early 80s, and uh, he offered to be our wine consultant. Andre Chalchev <laughs> was the winemaker's winemaker in California, and he's the one that put those great early wines on the world map for California and the rest of us. Wow, that's awesome that you were yeah. able to do that and then yes, give it his and, attention. And said, well, yes, we would love for you to consult with us. <laughs> that's not <laughs> so, a bad start. <laughs> so, so that's not a bad start, and he got us off on the right start. And so we've had uh, 46 years now. That's that's so great. That's so great. And Sergio, you got here in 2013, correct? Correct. And you were from Chile. Yeah, I am from Chile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I came with um, my knowledge of cool climate winemaking, viticulture and winemaking, and uh, uh, expecting almost the impossibilities of growing grapes here. But I found a, a you know. A, Gorgeous place that where where vines can grow easily and, and uh, as as healthy and, and as productive as anywhere in the world. It's actually well. Long story short, it's 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 again a matter of where they're planted, and by that I mean the very block that they're planted on. It's not like a region, a subregion, a county. No, it's it's the vineyard itself that explains the potential that we we see in the, in the wines. And are you, you, you mentioned that you had a lot of experience with cool climate wines. Texas isn't necessarily known for a cool climate. Nope. So, so how, how much different have you had to adapt your winemaking style to deal with what the way Texas right. operates? Uh, you know, thinking about it, the easiest way to explain is that we have a outdoor greenhouse here. So, you know, what, what happens in greenhouses, you get everything faster, mm -hmm. everything ready, you know, sooner than, than the market, right, than, 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 than the rest. This is what happens here with, with vines. They mature a lot faster because of the temperatures, and uh, but they they go over each step uh, regardless. And um, so the the key issues that, that you have to keep in mind, you know, in a cool climate, apply to here only faster. So the season goes for five months, six months at, at the most, uh, instead of six, six and seven. Uh, months in, in, a, in a cool climate, so so that's that's the main difference, and um, it's a bit of a challenge because it, it offers you, you know, a burden in terms of uh, operations. Mm -hmm. You have to be ready to pick um, in, in in very short no notice. Uh, 
back there in Chile, you, you had you know several days to, to arrange. Once the, the harvest I mean, or, or the grapes were ready, you had several days to, to arrange, and you're not going to be late. Um, you can imagine days of, of, of 70 degrees and nights of 50 degrees down there while you're harvesting. This is not the case no. here. <laughs> you can have a 100 degree day and yeah. an 80 degree night. It just gets dark at night, right? Yeah. So, so plants are working a lot faster uh, following that temperature boost that, that they get. And, uh, and that's why it's, it's so challenging. Um, but potential in terms of quality, it's still there. Um, you have to remember one very interesting thing that vines, Vitis vinifera, the species that we use to, to make all these varieties, um, they are original from the Middle East. That's the botanically speaking origin of Vitis vinifera. So the Middle East has a pretty hot weather yeah. during the summer. Um, and actually I've, I've compared you know, temperature charts, long-term temperature charts from places in the Middle East like Shiraz in Iran and, uh, and they're almost identical to what happens here in central Texas. So it's, it's pretty astonishing to realize that they were so well prepared to come here and grow like they used to do it, you know, thousands of years ago. So, And I, I think I have a question for both of you because one of the things that a lot of people um, First of all, a lot of people outside of Texas don't really understand that Texas has a lot of growth in terms of its wine industry. Um, but the other thing is people who do know that plants or that we're planting grapes in Texas, a lot of the, one of the biggest questions is Pierce's disease and how, how to be, how was it addressed and allow for you to continue to have nice crops. And so I, I want to kind of get to you in a moment, but in the beginning, what sort of issues did you guys have whenever you were first planting to keep everything healthy without the vines dying off? Well, I think that's why they advised us to, to do the French American hybrids. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, after just very few years, we went with the uh, vinifera, um, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, all the varieties. And then, of course, in subsequent years, we, we've done Grenache, Syrah, Mavid. I mean, the, the you know, uh, everything's on the table. There's not anything. We're even, we've got a grower that's doing Pinot Noir and, and doing it quite respectably. Uh, we say the vineyard, you know, the wines are made in the vineyard. The site is so important, as Sergio was saying. And um, Pierce's disease, I mean, it affected us, it affected California, it affected other, but you just, you move on. You know, at, we didn't really uh, have an issue with it. Um, Fall Creek didn't. And um, we have had other issues, and so that's why we have had the advantage of over 46 years, we've been able to match the right grape with the right site. You know, some things didn't do well, but over the last four and a half decades, we've, we've, we've been making um, Sauvignon Blanc for 35 years from the very same vineyard. You know, fabulous, uh, desert-like um, soils in um, Fort Stock, Mesa vineyards. Um, same thing with Chenin Blanc, even longer. Uh, and some of the other varieties, maybe just 10 or 12 years, or uh, like across the road from Salt Lake Vineyards, but it's matching the right grape to the right site. The, we just have to work a little faster, as Sergio said, but not a problem. Not a problem. And are, are you doing anything in addition besides well, just site location that's have, kind of helping with the parasites? Uh, you, you have to think that in terms of your, your question, um, there was it was a national issue and a lot of funds were funneled into addressing this national wide, you know, nationwide. And um, and so there are uh, viticulture techniques and uh, uh, spray uh, applications that, that, that are included in the program um, that deal with the, with the uh, disease. And now you can actually live with it. Um, it's, it's always a threat. There are years that where, where the pressure is, is low, years where, where it's higher, but it's something that you have to live with it. But um, applying the, the right um, uh, procedures at, as, uh, at the right time you can you can go with you know with, with it around your, your venue, and that's why we have a number of different growers to spread out risk. 
because I mean whether it's PD or it's rain at the wrong time or you know any kind of hail whatever um, we hope that we won't hit any of our vineyards or anybody's vineyards but uh, um, you know we've got uh, them spread in quite a few locations in the hill country so speaking of weather it's it's been an unusually rainy year this year <laughs> like flooding yes. all the time non-stop rain so how do you feel like that's going to impact the quality of the grapes for this season well rain is not bad um necessarily i'm, I'm more worried about uh not raining or i mean raining in the wrong time basically in previous years you know we had uh 2015 if you remember uh it was the the rainiest may on record still is and um where we had that terrible flooding in, in uh with, with the black river and um so but that was that was in may which is before the ripening period of, of grapes and during that time so from butt break to, to variation which is the change of color uh, you can have, I wouldn't say all the rain you want, but you know, it, it, it doesn't harm anything uh, except, I mean, it, it, it makes plants grow and, 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 uh, and they establish themselves in the, in the canopy and the, uh, the trellis, so that's totally fine. And this year, that was fine too. I mean, it, it wasn't any more rain that we had to have um, until the ripening starts. Then ripening starts with the variation, which happened uh, maybe three weeks ago. It varies, but um, and it has been r uh, raining more than usual, but it's not like you know too much still. And still, I mean, we have had um, I don't know four or five days without rain right now, for example. And that's the same time you spend not irrigating your vineyards when you have yeah. to irrigate. See what I mean? So. So rain is, is not a bad in, on itself, but um, it's 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 uh, it's in the wrong time when when it harms, and particularly going close to the to the harvest. Um, and Sergio would be the first one to tell you that every site that he chooses, I think the number one choice thought is be sure that it drains well. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, so and, and this land out here. I mean, last week we had that horrible rain, and because we were clearing our corner lot and the trucks were getting mud and everything. And I couldn't believe in the morning and in the afternoon, it, it dried up, the mud dried up. And I, I thought, boy, that's a good sign. So, so yeah, uh, this, a rainy year anyway, it, we can have the rainy years, just like they do in Europe, right? Um, uh, it, it, it kind of divides the waters between those sites that we're not supposed to well, the, 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 they can have a, a lower potential um, from the, the ones that have the highest potential. Uh, you, you can see that every year in, in, in renowned wine regions, you know, the, the best sites are always the best sites. One, the, the only, probably, the, one of the most important uh, aspects or factors explaining that is drainage. So that excess water that may fall goes away. And it's not available for plants to, to pick it up and grow and still grow and, and, uh, and keep growing. So instead, they have a little bit of water during the rain, you know, when it, and then, and then it, it just, just drains away and, and it's no longer available. And plants go back to their stage of, okay, I'm struggling for water, I need it, you know, I'm thirsty, yeah, until the, the following rain or the following irrigation cycle, you know? Yeah, I, I remember a long time ago talking to one of my debut set instructors and they said the entire process of wine is all about stress. Everything from getting the grapes grown and then at that point the stress is off the plant and on the winemaker. <laughs> and then, and then this is, once the wine is made, the stress goes into the marketing department, getting the wine out. So there's always stress in the wine's life cycle. And I always thought that was a very interesting thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good way to put it. Yes, yes. yes. All right, well, I don't want to uh, take any more time up on questions at the moment. Let's get into some of these wines because these sure. look amazing. So uh, we prepare a glimpse of what we're doing here. Uh, we'll start with our left-hand side uh, glass. It's our Les Gallo Chenin Blanc 2020. Les Gallo was introduced a year ago, more or so, uh, with the 2019 harvest. It's a wine that 
it's designed to uh, for the people that are, are looking for a nice fruity refreshing wine but with without the burden of having a lot of alcohol and a lot of calories as well so this is a low alcohol wine it has uh, just below 10 it's 9.8 degrees which drops the calorie content to about uh, 90 per five ounce pour, which is the standard. The standard, the standard. Yeah. So, um, but still keeping the freshness and aromatics of Shannon and, um, and, and actually it's uh, a wine that, that can be done easily here in Texas, I have to say, um, because of the weather precisely. Uh, you get, you get, um, uh, the way we do this is harvesting early. I mean, okay, this that was going to be my next question. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah. by it's harvesting, all natural. Yeah, by yeah. harvesting it's early, you get less sugar, which means, you know, it later means uh, less alcohol. So, um, but we're always fighting here with acidity. So when grapes are ripe, and I'm talking about every other grape, when they're ripe, they have the right sugar content, the potential right, the, the, the right potential alcohol content, but uh, sometimes low acidity, lower than what we would like. Well, in this case, it has low acidity for the ripening that is, stage that it is, which is good for what we're tasting now. So this is natural alcohol content, natural acidity content. There's no correction here whatsoever. Yeah. So it's Plain from from the vineyard to the glass. It has a real. I mean, that was going to be the third question. So you're you're reading my mind here as we're going through here because normally whenever you're you're, you're picking early, you have to worry about the acid balance. Correct. And then with certain grapes, uh, you also have to worry about any sort of offensive like phenolics that may come yes. with that as well. Yes. But in in this case. The, it's a really nice bright acid, but it's not overwhelming like you would expect if you pick something no, that was a naturally high acid varietal. Right, really you early. worry about the acidity being so high because, yeah. because there's no sugar. Yeah, and exactly. And this just feels like it's exactly where it needs to be. I know, it's, it, it's, and the fact that this was just done all naturally with no correction, no anything like that, that is, that is no, really incredible. No reduction of the alcohol, yeah. which so many of these are. And the whole, the whole purpose was just to uh, those people that do want to. A lot of the uh, young girls want fewer calories. A lot of the older girls maybe <laughs> want a, a little less alcohol when they sit around enjoying with the younger girls who can <laughs> consume a lot more. Uh, but uh, th there is good tradition in France and some of the vineyards in Europe and uh, this is an idea that I've wanted to act on for quite a few years. Uh, they, they would make a lot of uh, uh, normal, in, during harvest for instance, they would make a low alcohol wine. They, they found that uh, when they break for lunch and have a, a big, nice, beautiful spread with wines, of course, productivity in the afternoon was a little bit lower. <laughs> and so, so these, are, these are kind of the family or the vineyard wines. And um, so I, I, I like that tradition because there are times. This is like the, the, the keep people happy, but keep them working. That's <laughs> you know, if we have a glass of wine with lunch and, and then we're going to go on and do other things in the afternoon, it's kind of, it, it's, it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. That's awesome. So it's got some pop, and we we simply just made up the name. The the hardest part of making wine is coming up with the name that hasn't been used somewhere in the world. Oh, I bet. And so I just came up with less calo, like or less alcohol, less calories. <laughs> Actually, that was the question I was going to ask. Was whenever you're you're coming up with names for the wine, it what what sort of thought goes into that in terms of, of just trying to find the right exact name to put on that label and is it a team effort or oh, are there just a couple a team, folks who are just working on yes team effort i mean uh management but that is the hardest part i mean we've we've spent months uh i mean even up to a year delaying the release of a wine trying to come up with a name in the past yeah. it's it's just not easy because every time you come up with something, it, sure enough, it's been taken, and we trademark everything we we do, of course. And so we just hold our breath when we send it to the trademark attorney and say, "Well, let's fly and, and uh, let's go." It was it, it worked. And, yes, and, and the Xterra is another good example. Yeah. Uh, the, our upper tier wines um, in 2016, the harvest was uh, the vintage was so incredible that Sergio said, 
you know, this deserves a whole new uh, level. Of, it is our most expensive wine. They were there right at $100 a bottle. And um, so we were trying to come out of, come up with the name and it will come strictly from Salt Lake Vineyards because of specific blocks within their vineyard. Mm -hmm. The sites are, are so specific and for these grapes. And, uh, you know, I, we, we played around with, well, it's, it's, this is um, tribute to the land. So out of the land is what ex terra is. And you, know, you can see terra on the uh, hundreds of thousands oh, yeah. of labels, but nobody had put ex terra together. And I said, get that Take it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it done. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that was a blessing. That's, that's so, that's so. And, it's, and it's, it's, it tells the story. No, that's, that's so good, but it yeah. can be a long process. Yes. Very long. <laughs> now, Jolene, whenever you're working with different groups and working with marketing those, do you, is that also a collaborative effort whenever you're trying to find, like, where is the right audience for this wine? And does sometimes the name really impact how you end up marketing that out to your audience? I, I mean, I would say so. I've, they've been doing this. For a long time with Falker Green, so I follow their cues and we all communicate back and forth very well and yeah. She's and, wonderful. She, I mean, I think, she, I think she goes to bed with her computer beside her and, and her fingers ready to so just jump on the computer. She is, she's always available. She gets right back to us immediately. That's so <laughs> Thank you. Right. But yeah, but we love, yeah, we love working with Fall Creek and it's just that uh, it's very cool. I'm learning a lot always and appreciate it and I do think yeah the names are very a big part of it but I'm not obviously because the wine is what it's all about yeah well and there's there's kind of different layers there too right you have you have the name of the wine itself but then because you have been around and you've been making quality wines for so long you also have the name recognition as well right. so it's it, if, if people aren't even familiar with what you've like like the Lascalo, for right. example, they see it's from Fall Creek, so right. they have at least some expectation of a quality that's there, right, correct? Right. So, Very so important. those those two things together can kind of help bring that name recognition, right. or at least this is just the way I see it in my Thank you. Uh, we hope YouTuber wine it. world. <laughs> well, we've, we've done something right. Right, I know it exactly. Thank you. We appreciate that. That was the perfect response. Right. All right, good, yes. good. So, are we ready to move on to yeah. wine number two? Wine number two is, is our uh, Servenberg Vineyard Chardonnay. Um, this is um, a Chardonnay that comes from here, from the hill country. The northern side of the hill country, or northern edge of the hill country in, in Boca, Texas, in between Lana and Brady. Um, it's, a, it's, a belong, it's a vineyard that belongs to our friend Alphonse and Martha Dobson. He is a character on, on his own. Um, <laughs> he, um, he used to be a, a Raiders, Oakland Raiders uh, football player back some time ago. Um, but uh, and and, uh, and they and they grow these Chardonnay, some Cabernet and Merlot as well that we make uh, uh, also into to some of our wines. So this is the first uh, grape that I came to get my hands on when I, when I got here. It was it was um, a low yielding year, and uh, I decided to, to just go ahead and pick it up. They, they were going to just forget about it because it was so little. We ended up making one barrel. <laughs> that we bottle into some 25, 30 cases, that uh, of which we still have a few bottles there. But uh, it, it gave me the the, the realization of, of okay, we we can actually do this here, and we kept uh, making it um, over the years. And this is the 2019. Um, it's uh, it's been very well received all over. Uh, one year it got uh, an amazing award. Uh, named the best white wine of the show in the Houston Rodeo. Oh, nice. I think it was 2015 or the 2015 Harvest. Um, so yeah, it has made us very, very happy. So the way it goes, it um, I usually pull cluster press, juice is uh, cold settled, and then it starts fermenting, and then it goes to barrels. Those barrels need to be French. And um, it stays there for the fermentation, and then after racking, um, it stays there for another year, sometimes longer. This this particular year was uh, a bit longer, some uh, 15 months, and um, during which it goes over malolactic fermentation. So 
this is 100% malolactic fermented wine. Um, that's that's on purpose and and with something in mind. You, you'll you'll be able to, to tell. Maybe you're you're waiting for the buttery shock that you're not getting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so the way it goes, we we do the. I mean we go through the malolactic fermentation right after the primary fermentation and this can happen um, a month later or six months later usually it's about four to six months later and um, but when it's done we just keep it there we don't do anything to the wine and and when it's done the buttery smell that you're probably you know expecting is at its max but from then on, it, it goes away. If you didn't do, if you stay away from the from the wine, it, it goes away until you know as long as you want, and then and then you, you get your hands on back in the, in the winery in the wine and, and, and start blending or racking, blending, mixing or whatever, uh, and per, certainly preparing for bottling. And so when when the smell, the dacetyl, the, the buttery smell is is blended in gone, you, know, you name it. Um, so what you are left of is a more complex wine, uh, more integrated wine, more like, like a big unit, you know, not, not things sticking up their, their heads, you know, uh, like, 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 the, oh yeah, I get the butter, I get the whatever, the vanilla, or it's, it's more kind of just Right. Working together exactly. instead of having kind of spikes of exactly. things that you're detecting. Exactly. So and more old world. Mm -hmm. Oh no! It, uh, this, this, yeah. yeah, this definitely it's smells. Lovely. Uh, yeah, it, it has a huge it's intensity on yes. the on the nose. Well, yes, and it's of course I I remember the great burgundies that Ed and I got to taste and at a very reasonable price in the late seventies and eighties and I mean. Five, seven dollars a bottle. Well, I mean, you can't touch those wines for a hundred, two hundred, five hundred dollars. You know, it's just uh, right. So, uh, in terms of your 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 belt, would you say you use French oak? Is it is it first run? Does it? Do you tend to kind of usually? It's 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 uh, it, ha it has been uh, from forty to sixty percent new oak every every year. Um, so there's some new oak there. I mean, like. As little as as forty percent. Um, so yeah, it, it's and I have to correct. One year was a hundred percent new new French oak. That was twenty fourteen because we didn't have white oak barrels. <laughs> so every oak, every barrel was new, and well, I just used them all. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Right. So so that year was a hundred percent new, and then and then we started kind of including new and, and used second use and, and so on uh, but it's it's uh, the plan is to, to keep between between 40 and 60 percent you know oak. not not as a recipe but uh, whenever I find that the blend is it's right then it turns out that it's 50 50 or or whatever you know so it's it's always it's always the the the, the recipe I, I, I always say the recipe is balanced so how do you get there it's your yeah it's your problem, or, or different decisions get to you there, um, but but not like this percentage of this or this. Okay. So so it's always it's always with the final blend. And and with your mm -hmm. with the new French oak that you end up using, mm -hmm. do do you have like a preferred toast on it? And I ask that because this has a really nice amount of secondary that's balanced very well with the primary, but it's not overpowering that you typically right. find when people are oh, using no. new French oak mm -hmm. and, and aging whites. So well, that's well, like, there's so many different kinds of French oak. My, well, yeah. Yeah. my free advice there would be to uh, make sure that the oak has been seasoned for at least three years. Uh, it makes a huge difference, uh, both in price, don't, don't tell, <laughs> but in quality, uh, when when you go from just regular French oak barrels to at least three years seasoned wood barrels, it makes complete difference. Um, so so you don't get the plankiness, the, the the hard tannins that 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 
go into the wine. And this applies for reds too. Um, and, and you get a more subtle, more uh, elegant wood character with seasoned wood. And for, for people who may not know what that means, what is right. seasoned? So, so you, you, you take a tree down and, and that piece of, I mean, or that wood is not ready until, well, until it's planted. They are made into into long. But it sits uh, out for three but years. It sits aged, and in literally a, aging in a wood. patio, yeah, yeah. in their patio over there, and and it's not, it, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, it, it, it it's, it's important wear because they need the rain and, and you know three full seasons to go under under exposed uh, under the elements. This this you know year round, summer, winter, everything. Um, so three years makes. The, the wood to get rid of a lot of tannins and it increases elegance. It's all it, it does increases the, the quality that we taste later in the wine. And uh, so when you talk to your coopers, I mean, you need to make sure it's three years and they're gonna charge you more because it, it of course, oh, yeah. it take, I mean, it, they pay for that wood in, you know, three years ago, you know, they the temptation of using, you know, the wood sooner, it's, it's, it's big, right? Yeah. So, but those those cooperages that that have kept the strict order of, of just have to wait three years before we even consider taking this to, for making a, a wood barrel, yeah, those are, are the most consistent ones. So, so that's a little key. Awesome. We, we've seen them make those barrels and see, seen the way they uh, cover them and, and the wood that's out in the yard. Isn't it fascinating? Is fabulous. <laughs> and, and then the toasting and spinning over the fire and getting them. Yeah. The rings on them. Right. Okay. So it, it, there's a whole world of, of, of on the wood barrel wood, wood making. Um, it's it, interesting to know that, it, that the, they they don't own the forest in France. The forests are owned by the state, by the country. You know, they're they're state owned. And and every year there are certain trees that are auctioned. And and so every cooper has access to certain trees. So it's very interesting. That's thing. interesting. Yeah. So, so um, again, prices may vary year by year, and again, the the temptation of using that wood in a year time because they paid a lot, mm -hmm. it's it's high. So, so yeah, you, you need to keep an eye on on where's how did they make the. the and, and I bet as the wine industry continues to grow, that demand for them to use it is just another thing that's gonna to continue to drive those prices up because if they know that they can use it now and turn it around, but people are wanting them to hold on to it, they're gonna they're yes. gonna increase those prices. And and um, I've, I've tasted so many times that um, cheaper French oak barrels, I like, even even being more expensive, I usually like American oak uh, over, over those cheap French oak barrels at, at, at a fraction of the price. So, uh, so it's not like having just French wood for having French wood. You know, you have to have good French. As American, I mean, I always keep an eye on the American. It, it, it applies the same thing. I mean, the, 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 the longer they season their wood, the better the barrel is going to be. It's cheaper to season the, the, the wood uh, of American trees, of course, uh, so they, they can keep the, the prices down. But um, it's also important to, to keep that. So that that has um, um, have been part of the of the making of this this wine. Very well selected uh, uh, French oak barrels. That's, and, and and you said whenever you first did, it was a very small yield. Are you still doing small yield in that vineyard? No, no, no. Or is that, that, is no, it no yeah, it has, it has grown has grown over the years. Uh, yeah, with so, yeah, we've been able to to, to make uh, I don't know anywhere from ten to twenty barrels blends of, of this wine each year. We also make a, 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 a stainless steel fermented wine from this vineyard. So that first year, it, it was only enough to make that one barrel, period. Uh, so that was very, very low low yielding. Um, because of a freeze, it was, it was some problem prior. But, uh, mm -hmm. but later, we were able to make uh, our stainless steel fermented wine and our barrel fermented wine. Same grapes, same vineyard, two different vinification. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to taste those two together. But that was just a, uh, I remember because that was Sergio's first day in the Certainburg vineyard. And Ed uh, said, well, you know, the Certainburg, uh, the, the Chardonnay is not fared well 
the freeze, I can't remember what it was that year. No freeze. You know, there's so little we won't even harvest them. Sergio leaned over and grabbed a grape and tasted it and he said, I want to make it small back. <laughs> yes, we will. It's like, we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, us. that's one of those things where it's like, it's, it's sort of that happy accident, yes, right? Where you yes, just kind of yes. find something and you're like, wow, this is really going to work. Right. I can't believe they were going to throw this stuff in the ditch, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, <laughs> well, it was hard to find something small enough to, to, to take it through the process. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it was almost made by hand. <laughs> right. Because mm -hmm. no stemmer for, you know, no no press. <laughs> so we had to kind of press it by, I mean, using a lab equipment or something. It, it was <laughs> like it buckets was, on top yeah, of buckets. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be creative yes. uh, when, when, when we did that. So yeah, it was interesting. That's such a cool story. Yeah. So what is this third one so that we have? So the third one, uh, it's our Grenache Rosé. Um, see, it's very pale because of, uh, you know, Grenache. We have a, uh, <clears throat> our, one of our main growers here, the Salt Lake Vineyards, uh, which is right back from where we are. They grow several varieties. We'll actually, the rest of these, all these wines are coming from their vineyard. So they have a Grenache that we have, we have done several things with the Grenache. Um, we have, um, I mean, or they have harvested in different passes because Grenache is a little, um, what's the word? Um, uh, shine, shelling itself has has uh, dark berries, dark clusters, and paler clusters at the same time. It can be a, a whole plant that way, or it can be clusters within the plant. Uh, they say it's something that has to do with development, and, and maybe in 15 years, we're gonna have all dark clusters, who knows. Um, the thing is that we have made rosé from, from it, and red wine from it, because the next Red wine has the the G on the GSM. Okay. GSM. So, but this last year, 2020, we didn't harvest it uh, in, on passes. We just sweat through it by hand. And uh, so, at the winery, we hand sorted the the clusters. So as it was, because the main <coughs> the main part was going to make rosé anyway. So so as as the press was being filled. We just kept the darker berries or clusters out of the load, and so only the paler <coughs> clusters made it to the to the press, which was whole cluster press. And that's why it's it's basically you can say that it's the least uh, time, the, the the least skin contact time, just just the time that the press cycle took place, and then they were separated. So that's why it's very pale. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then, and then, uh, interestingly, you know, the the, <clears throat> the red load that we were uh, able to separate had like a couple of bricks more than the paler. I mean, the, the juice from from the from the press. So you have it right there. There were precisely two different ripening stages: the the right one for rosé and the right one for red. Maybe. Well, maybe. That was very convenient. <laughs> yeah, right. Those, those wines right. were very considerate. And, and so we didn't, we didn't go through to the trouble of, of passing two times in the vineyard, and that that becomes very expensive, as you can imagine. So and and not very effective because people are just choosing yeah. themselves. So you have you have probably twenty people making the decision of what mm -hmm. what gets harvested. Instead in the winery you have two people making the decision of what, what gets selected mm -hmm. and with, with some more time, you know? So it's it's a lot more efficient way of, of separating them. Anyway, so so um, that's why we have this pale Grenache, but very uh, rewarding oh, and yeah, aromatic. It's, it just is Reminiscent of Oh yes, <laughs> every every everything that I've I've tried so far, I'm I'm very not just happy. I'm 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 very surprised about the amount of intensity on the nose. It's just everything is just extremely bright and pops out very well. 
like I don't have to like really even stick my nose into it, and right. I can yeah, still get the things and, flowing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and that's not what you typically think of whenever you're trying rosés and so some chardonnays, yes, but I mean even even this, like you can you don't even need to put your nose into the bowl, and you can still start detecting elements of, mm -hmm. of what's within the wine. Yeah, and this is going very fast. Mm -hmm. It has this really nice integrated acidity. It's perfect body. It's just velvety smooth mm -hmm. in terms of the mouthfeel mm -hmm. and the texture. Mm -hmm. And there's so much just bright fruit there. Yeah. Yeah. So dinner last night. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. This is just. This is just. So exactly what you need when you're by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a simple. Uh, uh, well, simple winemaking. It's. Um, it goes to the press. Whole clusters are whole. I mean, it's a it's a big part of it. Uh, a thing that that it makes the difference of having these delicate aromatics, you know, saved in, in the in the glass. And because um, uh, the, the the following step, which is cold settling, it actually just it's it's a it's a separation of, of the heavy leaves, but they're they're not that many heavy leaves because of the whole cluster press. That you get the cleanest juice possible. But after the the uh, cold settling, we just ferment a very clean um, juice, very low temperature. Uh, by very low, I mean 56, 57 degrees. Uh, four weeks later, it's done, and um, and basically we just uh, stabilize it. And, and bottle it soon after. It, there's no, nothing, nothing more to in, into that than, than just after fermentation, we prepare for bottling, and, and, uh, and there you have. It. So that's that's how these aromatics are are at its at their peak. You know, when, when you open the bottle. So, so that's. All right. So now we're on to wine number four, and you've already kind of let it slip. It's a GSM. Right. <laughs> um, we started with the GSM blend in 2012, like with the harvest 2012, and uh, it, you know, these three varieties, Grenache, Syrah, Mourvedre, go so well in Europe. No reason why they wouldn't go as well here in, in Texas. Uh, they like the limestone soils here. They like uh, the weather, the, the climate that we have here. Um, they uh, they grow just nicely, and um, the combination of, of these three, we have. Uh, you're, we're going to taste that Syrah at the, at the end. So the Syrah is is very strong, very um, full body kind of Syrah, but not jammy. It's it's kind of it's an elegant version of Syrah of warm weather, right? Um, so that, that give, gives the GSM a, a, a sort of a baseline. Mouvedre, I love Mouvedre. They, um, they, they, they're, they're deep colored and, and uh, soft tannins, uh, easy to grow in the vineyard. I mean, you can take book-like pictures of, of Mouvedre. They, they grow so behaving themselves, uh, much more than any other variety, I, I think. So, uh, but but they give us wonderful fruit. They ripe er, uh, later than, than others, but um, it's bright. It's it's um, it's, um, it's elegant as, uh, as well. And um, so those two kind of fight each other, you know, Mouvedre and Syrah. Maybe you would think that they don't need each other. Okay, that's why you have good Mouvedres and good Syrah separated. So when you see them together. Uh, you need a, a, a bond between them. And that's what the Grenache is doing in, in the blend. So to, 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 to kind of join them together and making a, an even better result, a better wine. So that's how I see it. Because uh, usually when you blend, um, you're trying to complement things. You're not, I mean, there are some commercial blends, of course, but if, if you're trying to make, to, to reach my recipe, which is balance, right? Um, you need parts of this because it's hard, or, or because of, of it, it has a lot of you know, body, but it lacks, I don't know, acidity, and then have this part, which is better in acidity, but lacks, you know, so they complement each other. So 
this is, I mean, wine blending is, is a lot similar to the holistic approach where the result is more than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, it Usually you, you can score individuals like averaging whatever, 90 points, if, if you may, and then the blend all of a sudden is 93, 95, 90, so it's more, you know? So this is what happens with, with the GSM uh, and I believe it's, uh, yeah, it, they, 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 they just weren't meant for each other. That's more than a sum of its parts, right? <laughs> oh, it definitely is. And yes. I mean, these three grapes are do so well at Salt Lake Vineyard and the Vid. We love that grape so much that we're a couple of other just not only the Xterra Vid, but we do um, single when we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it, and and it's a the, the way that you described the the, the way that the grapes are fighting and needing Grenache to kind of mediate that. That was that was actually a really great way of kind of allowing for the average person to understand why blending takes place. Be because I think there are a lot of people who think, oh, people think things are just blended because of tradition, or, or in some cases things are blended because there is just isn't enough yield for a single varietal or something, right? But they're taking it to that next level of, of not just saying we're blending it because of tradition, we're blending it because of something else. The same, we're blending it because we want it to be better than the everything. Yeah, better than what it could be on its own. Exactly. Right. And it's it's um, <laughs> that's that's how it all started, right? In you know Europeans when they were making the wine, uh, yeah, they were they were spreading their 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 um, risks in in many varieties, so so they're able to make the best they can every year. And blending different varieties. That maybe the, the the simplest example is Bordeaux, where you have Cabernet and Merlot, right? So Cabernet is strong tannins, and you know, and Merlot is silky and, and soft, and, and so the combination makes total sense. And then you have a little little bit of Petit or other varieties there to, to, to just add a little uh, spice, so to speak. Um, but but again, when you when making wines. I blend, you know, and, and especially when you're trying your best or trying to, to, to get the best of, of the year or, or the or that particular vineyard, uh, you, you're complementing. You're, that, that's the reason for, for blending. You know? All right, so let me uh, go ahead and move on to the next one with you guys. It is uh, one of the exterior ones that you brought. Right. So, yeah, we mentioned before in 2016, it, it was a, a low, again, a low yielding year, but an outstanding quality year. And the quality we got from our vineyards here in Salt Lake, uh, Tempranillo, Movedra, and Syrah was just outstanding. Uh, better than ever. And so we decided, okay, let's let's praise this by releasing a, a brand new tier of wines. Because they deserve to be, you know, that at that level. So that's why we released the Exterra. And yeah, we spent well the wine spent a long time in oak. Uh, aging, right? Uh, time that we spend figuring out the name and, and, and all the, the marketing uh, part of it, uh, the packaging. So, so here we have the Tempranillo from 2017, which is the follow-up. You know, the next year, next year the question was, okay, are we going to have Xterra again? Because 16 may have been related to a low yielding yield year, which is not always the case. It's not necessarily low yield, high quality. So it's, if, you, if you graph it, it's like a bell. So you have a, 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 a maximum you know, yield and, and quality, but if you go down in yield, you may lose quality actually. So anyway, so, um, so 17 came and it was outstanding here with the benefit of a higher yield year. It, it, it was a normal producing year basically, uh, but with the quality in it. So we were able to make this uh, wonderful um, Tempranillo uh, Xterra. And uh, yeah, these these spend, um, I think it's 22 months in oak barrels, French and American, and mainly American. Tempranillo and American oak. Like, like uh, Chardonnay is French oak, you know, Actually, I, I, I gave it a try with one American Oak one time. 
You didn't like it? Yeah. No. no. I mean, I, I knew it, but it, it kind of, okay, let's let's try one more time. One more time. No, it didn't work. So, but Tempranillo and American Oak goes fantastic. And French Oak, you know, does well too, but, but no reason why not to take advantage of the good combination with, with American mm -hmm. Oak. And, and there are some of the elements that you can take that, that are within that wine that you can see that it wasn't just a single type of oak. Sure, you sure. You kind of get a little bit of that spiciness sure. for the French oak, and then there's a nice vanilla that you're right. kind of getting. Um, the plan with, I mean, well, the oak barrels have, you know, their influence, of course, but the plan I have when, when aging red wines well, all wines in, 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 in oak barrels is just to get them better, of course, to let them develop over over the, the months that they spend there, and uh, and that they're complemented by the by the oak. And um, but the character of the variety and the wine itself, it what what needs to withstand and, and be on top of your you know, the nose profile of the wine and, and just the oak, it's like a, it's like a ballet. Uh, the oak is, is, is in the back, just helping the main ballerina, you know, doing her, her, her job, you know? So that's how I see the, the oak influence in, in the wine. Uh, it's just helping the whole stage, but the wine and the variety itself is making it the first role. No, that's that's great, um, and I like that you have that approach in your winemaking because I think there are a lot of people who think that the oak sometimes needs to be the star of the show whenever they're making wine, and <laughs> you, you kind of you might know kind of some of the areas I'm talking about traditionally, uh, but they, they think I'll hide some flaws. Yeah, sometimes. yeah, uh, and, but it's it, it and, and that's probably it, right? They're they're trying to make something that's a little bit more. I guess mass is consumable, and they're worried about that yes. if there's flaws in the grape, people aren't going to buy it. So they overuse oak to try to hide those types of flaws. That's a perfect reason. I think there's a, there's another thing. Um, you know, oaky wines are, are a thing. I mean, they, they, they can be success, successful. Actually, I know a couple of, of oaky wines that are very successful. Uh, I think that the consumer, the massive consumer. When, when they're able to pick something, whatever it is, they are convinced that they know more mm -hmm. and that the wine is good because they picked something. Make sense? Yeah. So, so, okay, like, oh, oh yeah, this is the oak that I've been told all the time. Finally, I got it. So, okay, I like this. Yeah. See? So, it's, I think it's part of that, um, what, what explains success in oaky wines. But an oaky wine is easy to make. You just throw a lot of new oak, and you're gonna have your oaky wine, regardless of the fruit that you have. Yeah. So instead, of making a balanced wine, a, a complex, a, a, a um, uh, complex and concentrated at the same time, and elegant at the same time. Those three elements are, are always, you know, uh, the the ones that need to be in balance. Yes. And that, that's, that's that, more challenging. Yeah, and that intensity that you have on the Tempranillo is amazing. It is just. <laughs> it's there. I mean, you're, there's no way you're not going to be recognizing right. that wine when you pick it up because, like you said, this is this. I mean, if if you go grab your your typical Tempranillo that you're going to find from some of the vineyards up north in Texas, and you and you pit it pit it up against this, this just has a whole nother level of just concentration to it than what you typically get typically get with some of those other ones that you're going to find. Mm -hmm. And while those are good in their own right, this is something that is just. I mean, it really, it really, I mean, you said it deserved its own label. Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm tasting this wine and I just absolutely love it. It's just not only smooth and just extremely well balanced with everything on the acid, the alcohol, but it's just it has this really great, just punch in the mouth of flavor. And, and everything just works really well together. Yeah, no, it's, it's a beautiful wine. You know, Texas has had a hard time getting uh, any of the, the what I, Called the, the three uh, most prominent uh, international wine writers, Jancis Robbins and James Suckling, uh, and Robert Parker. You know, there, there are a lot of others too, but James Suckling kind of broke that mold. And in, was it in 2018? He decided to do what he called an American wine revolution and taste wines outside of the West Coast. So eliminate Oregon, Washington, and California. 
and see what was going on in the hinterlands. And I mean, I have, I'm so grateful for that because it's um, for him to put the spotlight on the rest of, of the USA. And he, I don't, uh, he tasted a thousand wines probably from 30 or states. We know uh, yeah. wine growing every Almost state. Almost every year. state except yeah. the West Coast. Yeah. And, um, and then he did it again in 2019, and of course then COVID he didn't, but we're hoping he's going to pick it up this fall. But um, let's temper Neo. I, well, I mean, Sergio had five, he, he sent him the five wines. Uh, Chardonnay took a 90, uh, the GSM, or was 90. that like 90? Yeah. And, and the and uh, Tempranillo. Tempranillo. Which one took the 91? The Tempranillo, the Tempranillo that first time Tempranillo. Yeah, the 2016. And and actually, um, with this fruit, the Shannon picked a. Oh, yes, that's right. You did riper. the barrel. Oh, well, that was the. the then in 2019, he, we sent, he only had three wines to send to me. He asks in October, so it depends on what, what's ready. But he did a barrel fermented um, Shannon Blanc. And um, the Tempranillo took a 93. 93. Now, this Shen is very one. This very one, and then the ninety-one on the Chenin Blanc. Was, I can't remember this the one that was line. mentioned in the decanter I article? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Or was that was that a different? Uh, one? I remember actually, it was one of the exteros. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking if it was the twenty sixteen. I think it might have been the twenty sixteen. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, or the one, the one yeah, I, I remember yeah, looking it was at in that. The yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I remember looking at that and and just going, I was like, man, that's like tied for the highest score <laughs> out of all the wines that were written in this article. I mean, I mean, we are so thrilled that that that, that he kind of broke the ice, and, and maybe so we're hoping other mm -hmm. international it, because that's what we want. Exactly. We never, we never, and I never got into this not thinking that it was going to be just just a a regionally known product you know we wanted to create uh, truly um, a tradition like a French tr tradition for French wines a Texas tradition for Texas wines. yeah and, and I think there there are a lot of folks who are like I've seen a lot more articles I would say probably within the last two years where more things are being discussed about Texas and its wine industry and even, I mean, so every little every like, little bit helps. Exactly. I mean, there's even uh, things that are going on with publications where they're trying to do like, all right, we're going to have a, a voters poll of the best wine regions, and you see the Texas Hill Country is now labeled as like one of them. And the last time I looked at the survey, it was winning. Yes. yes. <laughs> that, that, that was just last week. They were the, the uh, Texas yeah. Hill Country Trail was saying everybody vote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, and I mean, it's just incredible because I mean, if 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 People don't want to vote for it, they're not going to, right? Yeah. But the fact that, that people love the area so much that they're that they're actually willing to take the time to go sign into that website right. and do the survey and do all that stuff, exactly. that really shows you that like there is importance with the region. And there are people who are very excited about continuing to showcase this. I mean, if you look five years ago, they never would have mentioned the Texas Hill Country in a lot of those articles. Or if it did, it'd probably be at the bottom because they just were like, okay, yeah, Texas is the Hill Country as, yeah. as wine, as an ABA or a few yeah. ABAs out there, like we'll just let them have their place on the page. But people are voting for it. Like I, I know people who fly in from Mississippi, from mm -hmm. New York, from all sorts of places okay. to spend a few weeks here in the Hill Country yeah. tasting wine. Well, and that's, that's what they're here for. That's right. It's, it's a beautiful area. I mean, interlaced with lakes and hills and you know, cattle country, uh, and now vineyards. You can throw mm -hmm. vineyards in the map. Mix, but you know, lots of resorts and, and great recreational opportunities, and and wine tasting is another one. It's another art form. Mm -hmm. And um, but my husband, in, with using his uh, law law degree law, legal license, even though he hadn't, hadn't practiced law since 1980, <laughs> gave up his law practice, had a short, very short career, about five years. Um, he he created the ABA because we kept going back to France and other regions in Europe and. I said, you know, we will never have credibility until mm -hmm. we create um, uh, an Appalachian or an uh, ABA for the Texas Hill Country. And well, we did that in 1990. It also helps the industry because I, I'm trying to remember who, who released the study. But I, I remember reading about it in Wine Enthusiasts talking about if you actually have a bottle that's from a specific ABA, it can raise the value of it by about 25%. Mm -hmm. So it also raises yeah, no, exactly. the, the, the market value right. to help the industry continue to grow, right? right. So, so all of those things are just 
very important. And uh, I, I, I wasn't aware that, that <laughs> the ABO script, thank you for doing that. <laughs> well, I started in the early 80s thinking about it, and I created the Texas Hill Country Wine and Food Festival in 1986 and used our star chefs, who were the, um, there were three of them that, that were getting known nationally and internationally for the Southwestern cuisine. I don't know if you're at all familiar with that, but it's Robert Del Grande. At Cafe Annie in Houston, Stephen Piles in Dallas, and uh, Dean Faring from the Mansion. Uh, they they started with the Southwest cuisine, and they called us up one day. Stephen did and said, "Hey, you know, we're we're getting invited to Wolfgang Puck's tasting in L.A. Uh, and if we're going to take our Texas food, we need to take Texas wine." So we started in the '80s, going to the, and then next year it would be in. Lincoln Center and, and say, gotta go to New York with us and we do that or we go to Philadelphia. And so after a while I thought, this is how I'm gonna get the Texas Hill Country ABA. Because then uh, he, could, he could prove most of the, um, the, 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 take care of most of the criteria. That uh, is a, uh, geographically different from the surrounding area. If you look at the Texas map, the Texas Hill Country pops up in the middle. Oh yeah. You know. Uh, Topographical map and uh, the weather. I mean, he flew for 29 years privately, so he understood wind, wind and weather and and all those uh, elements that said that yes, the climate is is different and for various reasons. But he couldn't prove that it was a known viticultural region <laughs> back in the not, mid uh. 1980s. So that's why I created this festival and I titled it the Texas Hill Country Wine and Food Festival. After '86, you know, I, I invited the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle. Austin American Statesman. Back when we had food sections, here were these headlines. Texas Hill Country Wine and Food Festival hosts, you know, chefs or hosts these vineyards or whatever. And after uh, three years of clips, he attached those clips to his application to the feds. It is a known here, here are the headlines. Yeah. That's so <laughs> that's that's smart. smart. Yeah, so <laughs> that's thinking ahead. You that's do what you have to do. <laughs> that's really good. That's and the festival had a 20 year or 25 year run, I can't remember. Yeah. And now it's the awesome wine and food, mm -hmm. food and wine festival. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're on to the last one, and this is the Xterra Syrah. Xterra Syrah. Um, again, a follow up 2017. Um, this stayed longer in the winery. We released the Tempranillo 17 like uh, nine months ago. Oh, wait, a year ago. And uh, but the, the Syrah was just released a couple months ago. So it stayed a very long time in oak barrels, almost uh, almost three years uh, before it was it was ready for for blending and you know taking care of it and, and get it in the bottle. But look what what it does. I mean, like the, the strength of the of the fruit was so much that we needed that longer period of of uh, uh, oak aging. Yeah, it, it's got a, that gorgeous black fruit note. It's got that nice pepperiness that you would expect from Syrah. Uh -huh. And it's just, I mean, it's just taking up the entire box. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know what the color is. Wow, that's so good. And there's like a little bit of a minerality that I'm detecting in there. So see, it's, I want to, I mean, I guess we're we're in the process of defining who we are here and what do we need to find in glasses to say, I think this is Texas Hill Country, uh, or even further driftwood, because this is you know a, a special little area as well. Uh, maybe that mineralogy that you're getting it has to do with with that. I'm, I'm going to see it repeating. Uh, year after year, and and probably because we need a, a, a you know several years to kind of focus on what's coming over the years um, to to get to the bottom of this, you know. Uh, but yeah, that, that might be one. It, and so you talked about having your your own kind of stuff with with what you're trying to find with this wine specifically. Like this wine should have kind of what we're expecting it to be, rough like like this in general, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that this is a question for both of y'all. As Texas continues to move down this path of growing its wine industry, do you feel like there's going to be any sort of specific thing that Texas is known for when it comes to wine? You mean a variety? Yeah. A, a variety, right. a technique, a blend, 
I mean, I, because I've seen people, and I've talked to folks and interviewed them on this channel, you, you have someone like, like Benjamin Calais, who's doing Bordeaux and, and uh, Rhone styles. And then you have someone like Michael Bilger over at Adega Vinho, who's focusing on Portuguese varieties. And then Ron Yates, Ron's all over the place. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm not. <laughs> <He's our cousin. laughs> so I mean, you, you have all these great producers who yeah. are who are just creating a lot of things and really liking the the niche that they're working on. But do you think there's like something that's going to be over encompassing of Texas, or could it just be how unique all the things are here? Well, it's yeah. a big state. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's the size of France. You look at all the different regions. They're basically a, a couple of major regions, but the Hill Country is such a huge appellation, you know, ABA, that there, there are a lot of sub, sub mm -hmm. regions, sub ABs there. So it remains to be seen, but um, I mean, we have honed in on Salt Lake Vineyards because of that site and certain bird vineyards too. So I mean, we, we, we grow the, the Bordeaux red varieties at certain bird in Boca, Texas. Alphonse Dodson, I don't know if you've met Alphonse. No. Oh, okay. well. You got me. You got me. You will. Yeah, you will. You won't forget him. Yeah. And, and he walks between the rain grass. I mean, he can. It's, it's, he's an amazing man. And Chardonnay. So I mean, those are vineyards. And and yet we've done Rome varieties and uh, a variety of things. And Scott Roberts, who owns Salt Lake Vineyards, is very willing for that to be kind of our learning laboratory. I mean, he's he's experimenting with a lot of different varieties and. Sergio says every every variety is on the table. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, so it, it's so hot here that plants need to activate a special feature they have, which is called heat shrub genes. These these were you know from the early times that they were developing in the Middle East. So every every time temperatures go above 100, these genes are triggered and they express heat shock proteins. And these proteins protect plant elements and structures from falling down or from breaking up uh, uh, following the effects of, of, of a high heat, okay? So uh, it means, this means that the, uh, every variety, to, because they belong to the same species, <coughs> every variety needs to put this in place once they feel the high, the, the racing temperatures early in the spring and they're ready to have weeks above 100 degree and without any issues. So when you have a heat wave in a cooler place like Chile or, or the West Coast or Europe, they get smashed with uh, a lot of uh, uh, heat, heat related symptoms, you know, shriveling berries, burned leaves, curly, curly leaves, you know, that because of the heat, the heat is too, too high. But it's not too high, it's too sudden. Too, too unexpected. Plants were not prepared, so they didn't have the time to, to have this in place. Here, since the temperatures will go up steadily over the spring, they're fully prepared and ready for, for the summer. Um, and so that's why they, they, they go over periods and periods of, of high temperatures without any issues. Only faster than that, that we spoke earlier. Just, just they work faster. So just by being here, growing, any variety has to do this, and that includes warm weather varieties for sure, but cool weather varieties too. And this second line, well, the first and second lines are examples of that. Both went over temperatures that would have been unimaginable in Burgundy or whatever, you know. Instead, you're, you're getting the quality and the consistency because it's not just a lucky shot there in one year. It's, it's been years after years making a great consistent um, wine out of these fruits, out of these uh, vineyards. <clears throat> so, um, so that opens the fan of possibilities for Texas. I think that, this is technically speaking, but in the, also in the commercial grounds, um, yeah, putting all your eggs in one variety, like some Markets, have, I mean, uh, wine producing areas have done. Like I, I remember, Australia, they, they they have, you know, they created their industry amazingly, and they were making beautiful wines until all of a sudden nobody liked Shiraz anymore, and they went 
down and they're trying to, to reconfigure themselves because of that, that problem. I don't know what's going to happen with other varieties, I'm not going to name names, but, but some, some other regions are, are so focused on, on one single variety that it's scary. Okay, because markets are just liquid, you know, they, they go trending different ways. And so I think putting, putting uh, diversity and, and maybe that would be our, our statement, you know, diverse and, and interesting. And, and uh, so you can discover wineries that, that do different things and, and specialize in different other things because they just planted those grapes. And, and, but showing the ability to, to be diverse uh, I think that's uh, more long-lasting uh, way well, this, this, The tagline, Texas is a whole other country. Well, it truly is, yeah. and with different regions. But uh, within these regions, we have found that we can grow so many different things. Because well, I, of the Eat Shop gene, yeah, really. Yeah. Whereas Napa and Sonoma, if they have a cool spring, and then all of a sudden they get a hundred, yeah. you know, heat spot to 103 degrees, you know, it's devastating. Yeah. But, our grapes get prepared in plenty of time. Yeah, I, I, the biggest things we have to worry about here aren't necessarily, it, it, and people think that the heat is what's really going to cause a lot of problems here. A lot of it is the late season frost and the hail oh, that comes through. That's right. devastating right. for our area. Right. Right. And I think a lot of people think Texas is so hot it can't grow grapes. No, we grow some great stuff. Yeah. We just need to get them there. Yeah, well, exactly. Right. Yeah. We need to get them in the water. <laughs> But you see, every every wine region faces their own challenges. Yeah. I'm sure you saw those those beautiful but tragic pictures of Burgundy burning yeah. at night. Yeah. I mean, beautiful sight. I mean, like amazing pictures. Yeah. But it's. I mean, they they were trying to save their crop. You know. So yeah, every every region has has challenges. Um, yeah, we we are we have our own here, and uh, but I think we can we can still you know make good things. No, this is this has been a great experience. Thank you so much for spending the time oh, to, to educate we, my we viewers. Love, well, we love, <laughs> we love to talk about it. It's another <laughs> subject. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, yeah. I, I would hope that the people who are running the winery really like to talk about oh, it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, and, How many and, hours do you have? <laughs> right. And you know, I love your shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Because, because that, that was a game changer yeah. for California. Yeah. Or, I should say, the new world. Right, because because we all jumped into into that thing of saying, hey, we can do that thing mm -hmm. too. Um, so I think that putting our our wines, I'm not gonna say against, but side by side other regions' wines, to realize that we can do just as good, even better. You know, it's it's a good thing. So every time we have people going to your your outlet and, and realizing, okay, uh, I mean, yeah, you, you can you can have. A Tempranillo, a blend, or a Syrah from, uh, or a Chardonnay from Texas that can be as good, if, if not better than you know benchmarks out there. That's that's good for us. Mm -hmm. oh, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, everything we can do to grow the popularity of the area, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Thank all you. for it. Well, it's, it means so much more for you to say something nice about our wines than for us to say something nice about our wines. So, I can see that too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Or, or James Zuckling. So, so keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just some dude on the internet trying to get people information about Texas wine. That's what I'm doing right now. Bravo. So. Bravo. <laughs> Cheers.